Stanford University. All right, let's, um, let's, start, let's try to get to the heart of some of the aspects of string theory, which uh, are really very central. We haven't talked about them, but we've set up many of the questions. We've set up many of the ideas. Um, I want to show you first something which has both to do with why string theory has gravity in it, and it has to do with why there are such unusual constraints on the allowable kinds of string theories that you can have. I'm not going to actually get into 26 or 10 dimensions, but I'm going to give you an example which shows just uh, how tightly constrained the idea of string theory is compared to the idea of point particles. Um, point particles can move in curved spaces. A very, very simple example would just be, this is something you can, uh, you can look up, I suspect, in elementary uh, mechanics textbooks. Ordinary particles moving on a curved surface. Curved surface could be a sphere, doesn't matter. Some sort of curved surface, it could be positively curved, negatively curved. <laughs> in fact, it doesn't have to be two-dimensional, but I'm drawing it as two-dimensional. Let's say a two-dimensional surface, and a particle on it, a particle is described by a point on that space, a point and a velocity, if you want to know uh, the uh, future history of it. And it moves on a trajectory. Moves on a trajectory. And it satisfies an equation of motion. The equation of motion is some form of Newton's equations uh, projected onto the surface. Well, how does a point particle move? I'm thinking now about um, ordinary non-relativistic particles moving on a curved uh, surface without any forces. It, it, the forces, of course, are there to hold it in the surface. But other than the forces needed to hold it in the surface, no other forces. How does a point particle move? Anybody know? It moves on a geodesic, which is another way of saying it moves as straight as possible. Uh, no, it doesn't deviate to the left, doesn't deviate to the right. It moves along a geodesic. That's right. If there are forces on it of one kind or another, uh, then it may move in a more complicated trajectory. You could imagine that this wouldn't be consistent. You could imagine that it might not be consistent. How could it fail to be consistent uh, to write down? It's just a differential equation, or just a Newton-type differential equation. Here's a way that it could be, which it, of course, is not inconsistent. It's perfectly consistent. Uh, as long as the surface is smooth, as long as the surface is smooth, differentiable, all the good things that nice surfaces have. But what do you really mean by a uh, the motion of a particle satisfying a differential equation? As always, you mean break up the trajectory into a lot of little pieces, replace derivatives by distances, and uh, think of um, a discrete version of it. That's the first step. Derivatives are really differences. Uh, and then take the limit. Take the limit in the appropriate way of more and more little time intervals. Question, how do I know that the limit exists? How do I know that the limit exists? Could it be that as I put more and more points in there, that the limit of whatever it is you're calculating, the trajectory itself, how do I know that the limit exists? Well, uh, these are just described by ordinary differential equations. People have been studying differential equations uh, since the mathematician differential was a young man. And uh, we know that the solutions of these things are smooth, regular, and have good limits. Okay. Now you could ask a more complicated question. You could say, wait a minute, I'm really interested in quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, we have a more complicated kind of question. Instead of just looking for a trajectory, 
We ask questions, for example, what's the amplitude that if a particle starts here, that at a later time we will discover it here? We find, again, there is an action principle, but the action principle is not to find the trajectory of least action, which gives a differential equation, but to use a path integral. And a path integral sums over all trajectories, including wildly varying ones Again, a trajectory being defined in terms of breaking it up into little pieces and then taking a limit. Now how do I know that the limit exists? Yeah. Are those trajectories all inside the surface? Yeah, they're all inside the surface. Yeah, everything takes place inside the surface. Yes, good point. Yeah, we're talking about physics in, in a surface, on a surface, whatever you want to call it. Those features which are completely independent of how the surface, um, uh, that depend on the geometry of the surface, but not in anything outside the surface. Yeah. All right, so how do I know that this very, very complicated path integral structure exists in the sense that it has a limit, a limit as you take the grain structure finer and finer? There, the answer is much, much more complicated, but it's equivalent to solving the ordinary Schrodinger equation on, on the surface. And again, that's a more complicated kind of uh, equation. It's a partial differential equation. And partial differential equations are more difficult. But partial was a very smart guy, and he figured out how partial differential equations work. And we know from 19th century physics and so forth that the limits do exist. They do make sense. String theory is more subtle, infinitely more subtle. In string theory, we're not talking about a point particle. We're talking about an extended object. Now, that's the string itself. Imagine a string which is constrained to move in a surface. And this surface does not have to be two-dimensional. But as I said, I'm going to think about two dimensions. Here's the string. And it's a quantum mechanical string, which means it's subject to, uh, to vibrations. In fact, uh, just, to, just to pick an example, let's talk about string theory where the space that the string moves on, in other words, real space, the space that the string moves on is a sphere. And it happens to be a sphere with radius r. It's a sphere with radius r. Oh, let's do a point particle first. In fact, let's do a classical point particle first. Point particle moves on a sphere. What is its kinetic energy or its Lagrangian? As always, it's just 1 half mv squared, mass times velocity squared, which is also the momentum squared divided by twice the mass. Let's write it that way. p squared divided by twice the mass. But now there's a constraint, and the constraint is that the particle has to stay on the sphere. Nevertheless, this velocity, what that means is this velocity vector is in the surface of the sphere. The momentum vector is also in the surface of the sphere. But other than that, it's just uh, standard classical mechanics. Now, if we were doing quantum mechanics, then on a sphere, spheres, the motion of a particle on a sphere moves in a circle, of course, a great circle, great circle of size r. The momentum is quantized. How do you see that the momentum is quantized? Well, there's various ways to see it, but uh, let me just give you a very simple way. If the momentum is p and the radius of the sphere is r, what is the angular momentum? PR. 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 So the angular momentum L is equal to p times r, in magnitude anyway. An angular momentum we know is quantized. We know that it's quantized in units of um, uh, h-bar. So some quantized angular momentum here. I'm not even going to bother writing it. Angular momentum is fundamental because it's quantized. So it pays to rewrite the energy in terms of the angular momentum. Let's write p 
as L over R and stick it into here, then it becomes L squared divided by twice M, let's see, what is it, twice M and now R squared, right? MR squared, you know what MR squared is called? The moment of inertia. The moment of inertia, in this case, of the point particle over here. And the symbol for it? I. L squared over twice the moment of inertia. So what characterizes the motion of this particle is, first of all, its angular momentum, but the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia plays a central role in the uh, energy levels, in all of the properties of the trajectories, but in particular, the energy levels when we're doing quantum mechanics. And that's an important formula. Good? So uh, classical mechanics of point particles is described this way, and the quantum mechanics of point particles is also described this way, L being angular momentum. And we know how to deal with angular momentum. It's quantized. OK, so all of that is straightforward. Now we want to talk about a string, a string moving on this sphere. Here it is. It's constrained to be in the sphere. The, sphere the, the spherical surface is all there is. There is no outside the spherical surface and inside. There's only the spherical surface itself. However, as I said, the spherical surface could be higher dimensional, but for the moment just two dimensional. And it's going to move around. Good. How do I know? that in the limit that I think of the string as a collection of little points, how do I know that the properties of this little string have good limits? The answer is they don't. The answer is, we, we, the, the, not that we don't know, the answer is that the limits don't exist. All right, so let me show you why and what happens. The first thing is to understand a little more about the size and shapes of strings. We want to understand a little more about them. So let's calculate how big, statistically, the string has zero point oscillations. The oscillators in the string are constantly vibrating, even in the ground state. Because they're vibrating, they give the string a little size. They give the string a little size. and. I'm interested in trying to figure out how big that string is when the zero point oscillations are included. So how do I do that? I go back to a formula that we had on the blackboard, maybe the first or second lecture. Let's do open strings just for simplicity. Remember this formula? The position of a point on the string, what is sigma? sigma is the parameter along the string, is equal to a sum over oscillators. Each oscillator has a frequency associated with it, so an n. And we have, let's call it a plus n plus a minus n cosine of n sigma, and there's one other thing, a square root of n downstairs. Does everybody remember that? Probably not. But if you go back in your notes. Hey. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. There may be factors of two, I, I don't remember in detail uh, whether the factor of two sits in front of it or not, but that's not important. This is the structure of it. Now, what do I want to calculate? I want to calculate in the ground state of the string. Ground state of the string is a state with no oscillations. I want to calculate the mean size of it, the average size of it. So the average size of it, let's calculate the average squared size. We'll square x, let's square x, x squared at any point sigma, at an arbitrary point sigma. What does that give us? That gives us sum on n and a sum on m. We're going to have a plus n 
plus a minus n times a plus m plus a minus m over square root of n square root of m cosine n sigma cosine m sigma. I've just written down this expression twice, once as a sum over n and once as a sum over m. I've done nothing special. Now what I want to calculate is its average value in the ground state. Average value in the ground state in quantum mechanics we represent like this. O stands for the ground state string, and we want to calculate its average value. Right? That means we want to calculate the average of this in the simultaneous ground state of all of the oscillations. Now you might think the answer is zero, right? Well, that's not quite true. Every oscillator in its ground state, quantum mechanical oscillator, has a little bit of zero point energy. That little bit of zero point energy gives it an average fluctuation in position, or in this case, in, uh, in x itself. And how do we calculate it? Let's look at the various terms here. We're going to calculate the ground state expectation value of this, O, O. The important pieces are these creation and annihilation operators. What happens if I take the piece with A plus times A plus? Can that have an expectation value for, uh, in the, in the uh, ground state? Well, no, it can't. And the reason is two A pluses, when they act to the right, create a state with two extra units of energy. You've raised the oscillator in twice, and that has no overlap with the ground state at all. Okay. So the term with two A pluses, that, uh, that can't contribute to this. How about the term with two A minuses? <coughs> what does A minus do when it hits the ground state? Zero. It kills it, right? It's also true, incidentally, when A plus acts to the left, it kills this. So the terms with A plus A plus and A minus A minus give nothing. What about a plus times A minus. This A plus times A minus. Okay, well, you just said that kills the yeah. left kills the right. Right, so that's not there. But what about the term A minus A plus? Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's, uh, look, let's look at it. A minus times A plus. That's still there. If it's zero, so be it. But I don't see any reason why it should be zero. Okay. What does this say? It says we create one unit of excitation for the mth oscillator. This says we remove one unit of excitation for the nth oscillator. Can you remove a unit other than the one you put in? No. Nope. No. So this can only be non-zero if n is the same as m. But if n is the same as m, what do you get? Delta pump. A chronic or delta, one. These are all discrete, so they're not continuous variables. Uh, you get one if n equals m, and zero otherwise. In other words, the sum over n and m is only a single sum. It's the sum over n of a minus n a plus n over square root of n, sorry, not square, n, n, square root of n times square root of m, that's just n, and then cosine squared of n sigma. Now, cosine squared is always positive, and it averages to about a half. Cosine of n sigma is a function which looks like this. If you square it, of course, it's above the axis because the square is always positive, and it averages to about a half. That's good enough for our purposes. It's, it's never negative. You can't get any cancellation, and it kind of oscillates around a half. So for most purposes, it's sufficient just to call this a half.
and that's about right. O, O. And what is this thing? This thing is just one. You create a particle, or you create an excitation of the nth oscillator, and then you take it out. That average value is just one. So we now have an answer. The answer is that the that x squared, now I'll tell you what x squared means in a moment, it's equal, the one half is not the important thing here, just sum on n, 1 over n. Now first of all, what is x squared? What is, what is x? I wrote here x of sigma, but I left out one term. Does anybody know what the term that I left out is? The center of mass motion. There's one term which corresponds to zero frequency, which is just the center of mass. So really, the thing that I've calculated was the average of the position of the string at point sigma minus the position of the center of mass. Think about that for a moment. What's it mean? You have a string, in this case an open string, and the center of mass is, may or may not be on the string. But different points on the string are separated from the center of mass. The average, the average separation from the center of mass is a measure of the size of the thing. The center of mass is where the center of mass is. And if the points of the string are not at the center of mass, that means that it's been spread out. If this is non-zero, it means the string is, is extended in size. And here we're calculating it, and we find out that x squared is this sum of 1 over n. Okay. Trouble. Trouble. Big trouble. Hmm? Why, why is it trouble? It's infinite. It's infinite. It's infinite. Now, most of these oscillations are incredibly rapid. The large n oscillations are very, very rapid oscillations. Maybe we should just say, really, all those very, very rapid oscillations are unphysical. Cut them off. Only take the first n, uh, the first 25 oscillations into account, and see what happens. Well, then we'll only have log of 25, and log of 25 is not a very big number. How big is log of 25? Log to the base e of 25? Not very big. Uh, it's a small number, a moderate number. But um, then we're not doing string theory. We're essentially doing a string of 25 particles. We're not doing string theory. Uh, We've got to go to the limit n equals 0. Now, it's an extremely remarkable thing that this causes no problems for the scattering of strings in flat space. In flat space, it's a, it's, it's, it's a real magical, uh, very, very delicate cancellations that make sure that the string, which is essentially infinitely big with rapid fluctuations taking place all over the place, doesn't bombard other strings far away, even though it's extended out all over the place. They're very rapid fluctuations. It's an amazing set of cancellations, which makes sure that all of this works out. But th those cancellations don't always work. They work in some geometries and not in others. So I'm going to show you what goes wrong on the sphere, and it doesn't go wrong in flat space. First of all, the message of all of this is First step, terminate the sum at some maximum n, n ma a maximum frequency. Later on, we're going to have to repair the damage by letting the maximum frequency uh, get larger. Now we can ask, how does this string behave as a function of n max? In flat space, uh, well, uh, here's the way to think about it. As a function of n max, the string occupies a certain region of space. It's the region of space whose x squared 
or R, whose R squared is equal to the logarithm of n max. The higher we make n max, the bigger it seems to spread out, but very, very slowly, but nevertheless it seems to spread out. Well, if this is moving in flat space, it has a energy which is just one half its mass times p squared. It doesn't matter that it's spread out. The motion of a center of mass of a billiard ball, this big, that big, moves exactly the same way as the motion of the center of mass of a proton. It moves uh, the center of mass, well, of course, it's not the same way. It has a different mass. But in flat space, the motion of a particle, the center of mass of a particle, separates off the fact that it's an extended object. You don't have to remember the fact that it's, a, that it's a extended if you're just interested in the center of mass motion. But that's not true in curved space. In curved space, they don't separate off so easily. So let's see if we can figure out what's happening here. Here's the string. Let's put the string up at the North Pole here. The string is up at the North Pole. And if I make as my first approximation that there's only one or two oscillating uh, modes, well, we could start with no oscillating modes. If there were no oscillating modes, then the string would be a point. It wouldn't be spread out at all. It would be a, like a, a just, just, just be a point. Then the string would just be a point, and it would be over here, and it would move as an ordinary point particle. How does a point particle move? It moves with an energy, which is the square of the angular momentum, over the moment of inertia. And what's the moment of inertia? It's just proportional to mass times the radius squared, times the radius squared of the sphere. If we set m to 1, then it would just be the square of the radius of the sphere. So this point here would move around the sphere on great circles, and it would move with an energy which would be controlled by the radius of the sphere. The radius of the sphere would go into this calculation in terms of the moment of inertia. OK, now let's take into account that as we add more modes of oscillation, the string starts to spread out. It starts to get a size and grows. Not grows with time, but grows with more and more um, oscillations here. It starts to get bigger. It fills up some region which looks about like that. Incidentally, if you ask what does it look like on the average, it simply looks like a tangle. The more modes that you add, the more and the bigger the tangle is. All right, it's fluctuations on top of fluctuations on top of fluctuations. And this thing starts to get bigger. Now think about its motion around the center of mass of it, think of the center of mass of it moving on the same great circle. The center of mass will still move on the great circle, but what about its moment of inertia? Moment of inertia about an axis. Here's an axis. It's moving. It's going around that axis. The relevant quantity is the moment of inertia about that axis, and it's governed by the square of the distance to the axis. The moment of inertia about an axis is proportional to a sum. It's an integral over the mass distribution. Each little piece of the mass distribution, you take the mass of that little piece, and you multiply it by the square of the distance to the, uh, uh, to the axis that you're rotating about. Now notice that this point over here is closer to the axis than this point up here. In fact, let's go to extremes. Let's suppose we include so many modes that, uh, all right, let's, let me draw this better. It droops down to about over here. 
it's rotating around the sphere this way. It's on the sphere. It's not inside the sphere. It's on the sphere. The point on the sphere up here, that is a distance r from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the axis. What about this point over here? How far from the axis is it? Is it less than or more than r? <coughs> Looks less than, doesn't it? But that's deceptive, because we forgot that the sphere is really a sphere. It's really a sphere. I've mo it's like moving the point down to here, OK? With the axis going in this direction, it would be the same distance. So this, this point over here, which is out here somewhere, is, is the same distance from the axis as this point. Okay. But how about this point over here? It really is closer to the axis than the point up here. So what's going to happen when I calculate the, um, uh, when I calculate the moment of inertia? The moment is going to be bigger or smaller or exactly the same as it was when I pretended all of the string was at a single point. It's going to be smaller. Right. It's going to be smaller. The, the, uh, the mass of the string is the same, incidentally. That does not change when you add more, uh, more modes. It just oscillates differently, but the, mass, the amount of mass that's there is just the sum of the masses of little point particles that make it up. The mass stays the same. But the moment of inertia gets smaller. The meaning of that is that the quantum mechanics behaves. You can either say, you can say it two ways. You could say the string is spread out and uh, like that, and therefore closer to the axis. Or you can just say it's as if the string moved on a smaller sphere. It's as if all of the quantum mechanics essentially takes behaves as if the string was a point, but was a point on a smaller sphere. Okay. But the more modes that you add, the bigger the string gets. Eventually, if you add enough modes, it's going to grow so that it's almost as big as the entire sphere. In other words, well, let's, let's go to some extreme where it, where it fills up a good fraction of the sphere. In that case, the effective moment of inertia is going to be much smaller than, uh, than the moment of inertia would have been if it would have been a point particle. But even worse, there's no limit, or at least as n gets larger and larger, the string begins to cover the whole sphere and the effective moment of inertia is actually zero. The average position of it is right at the center. If the effective moment of inertia is zero, well, that's a zero in the denominator here. That's not a good thing uh, for, uh, for the motion of anything. See, so why, why is it zero? I mean, it's still spread around. Is it it's raised? as if the thing sh the Well, it, it, it's, it, 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 no, it, it's not zero. It's not zero, but OK. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. You have to be. It, it does go to zero, but you have to be. You have to think about it in a different way. What you do is you say the string behaves if you if you only take into account, let's say, a dozen normal modes, then the string behaves as if it were a point on a, in a, on a closer circle. But now, instead of a dozen normal modes, let's take two dozen normal modes. Then what it does is it starts to behave like a string on this inner surface here. This is not obvious. This is what is called renormalization group. Renormalization group is a way of following the system as you add more and more degrees of freedom. What you can follow it honestly is for a small change in n max. But once you follow it for a small change in n max and you find out that it's behaving as if it were a lump, let's say this big, now you add more structure, it begins to behave like a, like a, a collection of lumps. <laughs> 
that also form a string. And you just do the whole process over again. You say with a dozen normal modes, it behaves as if it were a more or less a point on an inner region here. Now you add more of them, and it begins to make itself into a string of these same lumps. That has the effect of pushing it in again. And uh, eventually, it just pushes it to zero. So there is no limit. There is no limit. The limit of a string moving on a curved surface, and this is due to the curvature. If it weren't due to the curvature, you wouldn't have this effect. It's due to the curvature of the sphere. This happens in any number of dimensions uh, that as you add more and more modes, the behavior does not tend to a finite limit. It just tends to behave eventually as the motion of a string on an extremely small infinitesimal sphere, which means in the denominator here a zero. And that's not a good theory. That's what happens. So the answer is strings on spheres are not good. Strings on spheres don't make sense. What is the condition for a surface? And a surface, I'm, not, I'm using the term in a general sense. It could be, it doesn't have to be two dimensional. It could be three, four, 10, 26 dimensions, whatever, whatever the number of dimensions of space. What we mean by a surface is a geometry with a metric. A geometry with a metric. A Riemannian geometry. So what are the rules? What you really want is a set of rules which approach a limit. If you're near that limit, then, in other words, by a limit, I mean the limit that as n max gets bigger and bigger. You don't want the answers to change as n max goes from 100 billion to 100 billion plus 1. Or for that matter, for 100 billion to, uh, to 200 billion. You want the answer to stabilize. That's called a fixed point. You want the answer to stabilize and not to change. So what you would like is a situation with a geometry that when you do exactly the same thing, the geometry does not seem to change. In other words, we could define an effective geometry for a string. We take the geometry, and now we sort of average over the properties of an extended object, and that defines the motion on a different surface. A different surface being the effective surface that the spread out string moves on. As long as it keeps changing on us, as we increase n max, there will not be a limit. A limit would mean that at some point, as you add more and more structure to the string, the effective geometry stops changing and tends to some limit. That limit will be a good geometry for, for string theory to make sense on. OK, so I'll tell you what one can do this calculation very precisely for an arbitrary geometry. And you can ask. When you add additional modes, let's say you add, you go up to some n max, and you add one more mode, how does the effective geometry that the string moves on, how does it change? Well, how do you describe a Riemannian geometry? What's the, what's the variables that you describe in Riemannian geometry? The metric, right? The metric tensor. That's the description of the geometry. G mu nu of x. This, don't think of it now as the gravitational field, although it is the gravitational field. It's the metric of space, g mu nu of x. We have a geometry. Could be the sphere. Could be anything else. Could be a hyperboloid. It could be a thing with wiggles in it. It might be space-time geometry itself. Okay. A string moving on such a geometry, the effective geometry will change a little bit. Why? Because the string is, is, is spread out a little bit. The center of it uh, will move in a way that responds to a slightly different geometry. 
And so we can ask, what's the change in the effect of geometry when you add one more mode? Okay, the answer is, first of all, that it depends on the curvature. If the sphere weren't curved, this would not have happened. This has to do with the fact that the sphere was curved. So whatever the change in the geometry is, if it were flat, it would not change. But if it's curved, it does change in general. So there must be on the right-hand side something which involves the curvature tensor. The left-hand side is a tensor with a mu and a nu, a, a, a second-rank tensor, symmetric. Just a matter. So the right-hand side has to be a tensor. It's not g mu nu itself. It's some other tensor that has to do with the curvature. If it weren't curved, nothing would happen. So it must be that on the right-hand side is something involving curvature. Curvature is called capital R, and the full curvature tensor has four indices. It's a thing with four indices. R, let's say, mu, nu. No, let's not call it mu and nu. For the moment, let's just call it alpha, beta, gamma, delta. You can put all four downstairs, upstairs, doesn't matter. It's often uh, written with one index upstairs and uh, uh, some indices downstairs. Okay. This equation doesn't make sense. The indices don't match. But is there a thing that you can make out of the curvature tensor which also has only two indices and which is symmetric? Anybody know? The Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor is simply the contraction alpha alpha mu nu. That's called R mu nu, and it's the Ricci tensor. So when a careful calculation, let me see, is it plus or minus? I think it's minus, minus, minus the Ricci tensor. It corresponds to the sphere getting smaller when you add more structure. That's why, the, that's why there's a minus there. This is the equation that governs how the effective geometry of the string changes as you add more and more uh, fluctuation to the string. Mathematicians have a name for this equation. It's called Ricci flow. Ricci flow is a tremendously important part of mathematics. And it's an equation that if you start with a geometry and then you change it in accord with this equation, what happens is it starts to deform, and it flows. The geometry flows. Okay, it's called Ricci flow. It has very important applications in mathematics. I don't know whether it was discovered by string theorists or first discovered by mathematicians. I'm not sure, but that's what this is. It's a fuzzing out of the geometry because the points have gotten fuzzed out. It's a kind of diffusion of the geometry, which is fuzzing it out. The points have gotten fuzzed out by the fluctuations of the strings, and the effect of geometry behaves this way. Is there, is there a function of n max there somehow? Is that no, this is the change when you, all right. The change when you add, uh, it's the logarithmic change. It's the change when you change the cutoff by, uh, by a factor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, change in the logarithm of the cutoff to be exact. But it doesn't matter. It, it, it's the change as you change the cutoff. Now, what we're looking for, though, is geometries which don't change when you change the cutoff. We want something stable. We want to say we're talking about string theory on this or that space. We don't want the description of it to keep wandering away as we add more of these modes. So what we really want are geometries which are stable and don't change when we change, the, when we change things, when we change the cutoff. What does that mean? That means geometries where the Ricci tensor is zero. If the Ricci tensor is zero, 
That's like saying it's, well, it's not like saying it's flat. Flat space is, does have Ricci tensor zero, of course. It has all of its components of, of curvature equal to zero. So flat space is an example of this. Question is, are there other examples of spaces? This is called Ricci flat. If a space has vanishing Ricci tensor, it's called Ricci flat. Ricci flatness is essentially the condition that strings can propagate sensibly uh, on that geometry. Okay. Have good limits as the number of modes goes to infinity. All right, so there's, there's a condition on the geometry. Um, it's called Ricci flatness. It could be the space-time geometry that the string is moving in. In fact, uh, that's the way you think about it for the moment. The space-time geometry has space directions, time directions. But uh, anybody know what that equation? That equation has another meaning. Yeah. It's essentially the Einstein field equation for the gravitational field. The Einstein field equation for the geometry. It's the vacuum Einstein field equations. Einstein in vacuum. No matter, just gravity and curvature. I'll write out the Einstein equations for you, and then I'll show you that it's the same as, uh, as this equation. Anybody remember the Einstein field equations? Something equals R equals T. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. It's, it's a tensor called capital G mu nu. It's called the Einstein tensor, and the reason it's called capital G is because it's got something to do with gravity. But it's also equal to R mu nu minus one half G mu nu R. Okay. Well, R, what is R? R is R alpha alpha. <coughs> or, yeah, R alpha alpha, and that's equal to T mu nu, where T mu nu is the energy momentum tensor. Energy momentum tensor means the energy momentum of cookies, the energy momentum of a cup of coffee, but not the energy momentum of the gravitational field. Everything is in here other than gravity. Okay, the vacuum Einstein field equations mean the field equations for the gravitational field when there's nothing on the right-hand side, zero. That's called Einstein vacuum equations. Are there any interesting solutions to this equation? What are, there? What are the solutions of this? Schwarzschild is one, but Schwarzschild has a nasty singularity in it, so it's, uh, it's, it's uh, no, um, well, Robinson Walker also has singularities, but, uh, hmm? No, the Sitter space requires a cosmological constant. No, just gravitational wa waves. Just gravitational waves. Just th that's it, gravitational waves. It's uh, similar to uh, Maxwell's equations without sources. Maxwell's equations without charges. Do they have any solutions? Yeah, just uh, plain elect or just electromagnetic radiation. Uh, gravitational radiation also exists. The solutions of this kind of equation here in four-dimensional space-time, in four-dimensional space-time, in other words, one time direction, three space directions, the solutions of this include all kinds of things like gravitational waves, interacting gravitational waves. Gravitational waves can do complicated things uh, in Einstein gravity, but there's a whole family, an infinite parameter family of uh, complicated solutions of these equations. All right? Now, we're interested in Ricci flat. This doesn't say r mu nu equals zero, but let's take, let's take, when I put one index upstairs and one index downstairs, that's called the trace, when I, when I sum over alpha and alpha. All right, let's, um, let's raise one index. Let's write it r mu nu minus one-half g mu nu r alpha alpha equals zero. What's g? What is this thing here? 
one mu uh, g with one mu downstairs and one upstairs. That's a Kronecker delta, right? So that's just a uh, uh, Kronecker delta, delta mu nu, delta mu nu. And now set mu equal to nu and sum. Call them both alpha. R alpha alpha equals one half, or well minus, or sorry, is equal to one half. What happens to this when you set mu and nu both equal to alpha and sum? I think you get four, right? Four for the four directions of space. So this becomes either plus or minus a half, maybe times two. R alpha alpha. It does not. It does not say. Let's see. Um, two. It's two altogether. It's either plus two or minus two. I can't remember. But it's quite inconsistent unless R is zero. Yeah. Right. This equation implies that this is called the Ricci scalar or the curvature scalar. The curvature scalar must vanish if Einstein's field equations are correct, if they're satisfied. So this is not there. And the Einstein field equations in empty space is just r mu nu equals zero. What have we learned? We've learned that the only acceptable geometries in which strings make stable sense and in which the geometry doesn't change and change and change and change as you add more degrees of freedom are the solutions of Einstein's field equations. You can quantize strings in background geometries which satisfy Einstein's equations, and you cannot formulate them correctly in spaces which don't satisfy Einstein's equations. That's pretty impressive that out of the consistency condition for strings to have a well-defined geometry in the limit that the number of degrees of freedom becomes infinite, you derive Einstein's field equations for, uh, for geometry. That's an extremely impressive fact. Question? Yes. Uh, would there be a connection between the uh, uh, Ricci tensor being zero and the idea that, that, that it maps conformally? It is very closely connected to conformal invariance, but not conformal invariance in space-time, conformal invariance of the world sheet is very closely connected with that. It is actually the condition for the conformal invariance, but they, they, they are connected, yes. Uh, but I've showed you the simplest way to think about it, that in general, because the string spreads out, the effective geometry that it sees is different than the geometry you started with and in general doesn't approach a limit. If it does approach a limit, it's because at the limit, the Ricci tensor is zero. So Ricci tensor being zero are special. Okay, now we want to come to a subject. Oh, incidentally, I've um, cheated a little. I haven't cheated. I haven't told you the whole story. The whole story is that it really doesn't work, except if you're in the right number of dimensions. Uh, the subtleties of this kind of thing uh, are quite subtle. And it really only works that the answers become independent of, uh, of n max if, if the geometry is Ricci flat and in the right number of dimensions. 10 for superstring theory is 26 for. Uh, So that's the basic principle. The answers should have finite limits as n max goes to infinity. And that is enough to tell you that the geometries that you move in must be solutions of Einstein field equation. They must be gravitational waves and other things. Now we want to come to the problem of what do we do with 10 or 26 dimensions? How do we make sense out of them? And the answer is called compactification.
Compactification is simply the um, process of taking however many dimensions we want to get rid of. By getting rid of them, we don't really get rid of them, but we make them small enough that they become invisible except to very, very small things. We want to roll them up into little manifolds that our coarse-grained uh, apparatuses don't see. They may affect, and they will affect, they'll have you know, real serious effect on the structure of particles and so forth, the structure of elementary particles, type of elementary particles that you can have, but they won't be visible as directions that, uh, that you can move around in. All right, so let's talk about compactification. We have, let's take the case of uh, superstring theory where there are 10 dimensions of space-time, which is six too many. And one good thing is that the 10 dimensions of space-time have only one time and six space, and, uh, and nine space dimensions. We would, have, we would not know what to do with two time dimensions. What, um, physics with some extra space dimensions, that's, that's no problem. Things just get to move and more. But what would it mean to have more than one time beats me. And uh, probably doesn't mean anything. So superstring theory is a theory with nine spatial dimensions and one time dimension. It kind of ties into what Jeff's question earlier was about degrees of freedom versus dimension of space. Mm -hmm. In essence, what I was trying to say, it, never mind whether you know there's 12 or only 6, mm -hmm. the idea is that the more moving parts you have, the more degrees of freedom you have, mm -hmm. Okay, which is not the case for dimensionality of your coordinates, and mm -hmm. that's because you're looking at commonalities of those degrees of freedom <coughs> in, in dimensioning your space. The more dimensions you have, the more ways a thing can move. So there, it turns out in electronics design, mm -hmm. you can have multiple clocks. Mm -hmm. So there are sort of multiple times within the design. And essentially, what singles out a, a particular uh, signal as a clock signal is that it synchronizes a lot of other signals or ties things together, or connects to a lot of things. So Which means it really was only one time. And there are a lot of clocks. A lot of clocks is not the same as a lot of times. What physics would be like if you were... Well, the question is if you have regions in which they are effectively independent of one another, then they would be... So the thing okay, you make a theory with two times. I don't know how. When we say two times, we mean at every point of space there are two times. Not a region way out there where there's one time and a region out there where there's another time. I mean, at every point of space, well, I mean, I think the, the amazing thing about our universe is that, is that the geometry, space-time geometry, everywhere seems to be the same. Yes, and it has only one time. It, not, it also only has the same, same you know, whatever let him, let him manifold. Let him give the lecture, OK? <laughs> it's all right. We have time. I think that there are people that don't think it's nonsense, and that's why. Yeah, there are. There are people who don't think it's nonsense. However, it has never, um, it has never become any part of mainstream uh, thinking. And more than one time. More than one time direction, not more than one clock. OK, let's, let's go on. Um, yeah, so we have these six extra dimensions of space. How do we get rid of them? And of course, yeah, you, know, you know the answer. You roll them up. The simplest model would be a world in which, on the large scale, there was one dimension of space. Time is there, but let's just freeze time. One dimension of space, that's a long line. We can imagine particles on this line. Particles move up and down the line. Maybe they bind together. Maybe they form molecules. Maybe they do interesting things. Uh, who knows, maybe even they can form life. They can signal each other by launching a particle from one group to another group. And you can have some possibly interesting physics. These people who live on this line, who are made up out of these point particles, 
Well, I always like to say they have a rather boring life. Each one has a friend to the left and maybe a friend to the right, but my joke is that they don't have a social circle because you can't have a circle in one dimension. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> right. Very boring. Very boring life, and, and also they can't, you know, they can't pass through each other. They get, they, they, they bang into each other. Very boring. But then they look through a high power microscope, and they discover their line is really surface of a cylinder. Now they're too big to feel the cylinder. They're great big things which move up and down, but that doesn't mean that there aren't smaller things. And the smaller things now can move both along the line and perpendicular to the line. So there are new degrees of freedom. There are new distinctions between particles. Particles can move this way. They can move this way. They can even move this way. And there's a whole new game. This is the most elementary and simple example of compactification. Another way you could think about it is let's try to think about higher dimensions. Let's suppose ordinary space was two-dimensional, but that when the creatures who lived in this ordinary space magnified it, they discovered a tiny third dimension. What might that look like? OK, and uh, a third dimension in the same sense that, uh, that the circle here provided a third dimension. So here's, here's what it might look like. There's the world that they think they live on. But now they look under a microscope and they discover that there's a direction perpendicular so there's some thickness there. Okay? There's some thickness there. We'll call the top thing the ceiling and the bottom thing the floor. And there's some bulk stuff, namely space, in between. OK, now we're going to do something else. Having edges like this makes trouble for strings. The strings start to fluctuate, and eventually they fluctuate out and get bigger than the, uh, uh, than the, um, than the distance between the floor and the uh, ceiling. But we're going to do something, the same thing we do when we, well, what we're going to do is identify the floor with the ceiling. We could have done this. Let's go back to the cylinder. The cylinder is really a ribbon in which you identify the floor with the ceiling. You say that if you go out here, you come back here. In other words, here's the ribbon. And the cylinder is obtained from the ribbon by identifying one edge with the other edge. When you go out here, you come back in here. Same thing here. The floor and the ceiling are identified so that when you go out the ceiling here, you reappear on the floor. Now this direction, there is no edge. There's no edge anymore. And this perpendicular direction here has the topology of a circle. It's periodically identified. This would be an example of compactifying one out of three dimensions. Can you compactify two out of three dimensions? How many big dimensions, big ones, would be left over if you compactified two out of three? One. So we'd be back to the world of one dimension, but with something new. Two compact dimensions instead of one. Let me show you what that would look like. A particular way of doing it. This is a particular way of doing it. Take a, well, let me make it bigger. This is kind of a prism, an infinitely long prism. Would you call this a prism? I thought a prism, I guess. No, prism's the wrong word. Um, uh, Rectangular something or other. Uh, rectangular what? Rectangular parallelopiped, except that it's infinite in, in extent. Okay, right. Now it has edges. 
But what we're going to do with the edges is we're going to identify this edge with this edge and this edge with this edge. Not just the edges. A point over here is identified with a point on the floor. A point on the ceiling is identified with a point on the floor. A point on the back wall is identified with a point on the front wall. Here's the back wall, here's the front wall. So anything that goes out through an edge reappears on the opposite face at the same spot. That now has compactified, and there's no edges left. Once you make these identifications, there really are no edges anymore. Uh, you, to draw it, you know, to draw it on a plane, really on a plane, you take the cylinder, you slit it, and you open it up. Okay, so now it looks like it has a floor and a ceiling, but then keep in mind that the real geometry is identified and has no edge. Same here, there are no edges. Anybody who walks out one side reappears at the other and doesn't even notice it. So this is compactifying two out of three dimensions. How about two out of 10 or six out of 10? Yeah, you can do the same thing. And exactly the same thing. And this process is called toroidal compactification. OK, what does it have to do with a torus? Let's talk about a tori, because tori are the simplest geometries to use for compactification. The edge of this here, this face over here, is a torus. It doesn't look like a torus. It doesn't look like a donut. But topologically, it's a donut. It's a, so let's talk about tori. The simplest torus is a circle. That's a, a one-dimensional torus. It's just a circle. Right, you say a circle doesn't look like a torus. Well, it, uh, don't worry about it. We're going to define the thing that does look like a torus. All right, let's take a torus. Incidentally, when we talk about a torus, we're not talking about a shape embedded in three dimensions, a two dimensional shape embedded in three dimensions. What we're talking about is a topology. We're talking about the topology of the boundary, not the interior of the torus. We're not talking about a solid torus. We're not talking about a donut with the dough on the inside. We're talking about the mathematical surface of the torus. Okay? And what we're talking about when we see the word torus is the topology of the surface. Okay, there's a torus. And let me now do something to it. I'm going to cut it over here. Well, let's cut it over here. I'm going to take a scissor and slice it around here. Now remember, we're not talking about the stuff that's inside the torus. We're only talking about the surface. Cut it and open it up. What does it look like? It looks like a finite piece of a cylinder, right? But I have to remember with, uh, yeah, we've taken it and opened up. All right, it's not the same as the torus, but it's topologically the same as the torus as long as we remember that this point is identified with this point, this point is identified with this point. Anybody who walks along here and crosses this edge, that's over here, comes back over here, that's over here. All right, so we've done the same game, except we've taken a cylinder now and identified the left cut here with the right cut through the cylinder over here. That is now mathematically a torus. But we can go another step. We can now take our scissor and cut it along here. And now open it up, and it becomes a rectangle. So a torus is topologically the same as a rectangle, but we have to remember that the rectangle has identifications. If this point is called A, then this is also A. If this point is called B, then this is also called B. Let's follow the trajectory of a particle as it moves on a torus. <clears throat> 
a hypothetical particle, a fake particle moving on, uh, on a mathematical torus like this. What happens to it? Let's see if we can follow it. Let's suppose it starts over here moving this way. And assume that it moves in a straight line. OK? No forces on it. What happens when it gets to the, here? Reappears at the bottom, right? Now it goes at the same angle because it hasn't been accelerated, and it gets to over here. Gets to over here, reappears over here. Now what? Goes to here. Where does it reappear? Back over here. Right. Okay. Depending on the angle and depending on the ratio of the sides of the torus, it will either, if the ratios of the sides of the torus are rational and some other good things, uh, it will simply repeat itself and eventually find itself on the original line again uh, so that there will be a finite number of bands like this and then repeat itself. If the ratios of the sides are incommensurate, or if you have some incommensurate angle, then it will just keep going and going and going, essentially filling up the entire, or getting arbitrarily close to any point on the torus. But this is not the important thing. The important thing is that a torus is a way of compactifying space. That's exactly what we did over here. We took this and identified it with this, this and identified it with this. So this would be called a, two di uh, a compactification of two dimensions, keeping the third one uncompactified, but the compactification would be a torus. Tori are especially simple uh, geometries for compactification. Uh, there are other geometries that you could try, and, and, and uh, people do. I can't draw it quite the same way, but you could take a line times a sphere, a line times a two-dimensional sphere, so that every point on the line, a little fly moving up and down that, uh, that or a little insect moving up and down that line, would be able to move along the line or along a sphere attached to each point on there, just as, uh, just as there's a torus attached to each point here, you could do a sphere. Uh, for reasons that I'll come to, spheres are not good things to compactify on. All right, so this is the toroidal. Now, can you do the same thing with um, higher dimensions? Let's suppose we had, suppose we wanted to get rid of three dimensions. To get rid of three dimensions, we want to invent a thing called a three torus, a three-dimensional torus. We want to take three of the dimensions and make them into a torus. Yes, that's not hard. You do exactly the same thing. You take a cube. It doesn't have to be a cube. A uh, parallelopiped, or whatever you call it. And now, do the same kind of identifications. This face over here, A, is identified with this face over here, A. This one over here, B, with this one, B. And the back side of a, a C, this is in the back, is identified with C in the front. That becomes what is called a three torus. It has the topology of a three torus. Again, no edges, although if you try to draw it, you draw it with edges. And that would effectively shrink three directions. If you made the torus small, in any case, if you made it physically small, it would hide three dimensions, at least from your coarse-grained uh, measurements. So if you were doing string theory in 10 dimensions, and you compactify three, to 10 space-time dimensions, compactify three, you would have uh, seven dimensions left over, one time and six space. That's also not what we want. So what do we want to do? We want, to make a, we want to get rid of six dimensions. So we make a six torus. A six torus I can't draw on the blackboard for you. I suppose I could draw a four torus, but uh, we, get, we clutter up the blackboard terribly. What's, what's the figure that the four cube called? Uh, when you, uh, what? 
hey, yeah, 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 and then identify faces of that, but, um, or volumes of it, you'd be identifying volumes of it. But um, mathematically, all you're doing is adding axes and keeping and making identifications. A tor it's, yeah. It seems like all these dimensions, all these spatial dimensions greater than three uh, come back on themselves. Uh, yeah. Is there some... They're periodically identified. They're what? They're periodically identified. Yeah. yeah. They come back on themselves. Is that, that's fundamental, I, I guess. Well... You can't go infinite like X, Y, and Z can. You could have six or ten or nine, whatever it is, dimensions which don't come back on themselves. It just wouldn't be our world. You ask, why did nature choose to, uh, to compactify some dimensions and not others? That we haven't got the vaguest idea, but uh, we do know that we live in a world of three dimensions. Why do we assume the other dimensions are spatial? String theory, or no other theory that I know, quantum field theory, none of them make sense with more than one time dimension. Correct. Yeah. We, three... we know we have one real time dimension. We, there's no more room for, for more. But why beyond the, the four do we assume that the remaining dimensions are spatial? What else could they be? What else should they be? What else should they be? I'm, I'm not, well, I've got some ideas, but my... My, my point is that just because we can't identify what they are, why do we assume they are spatial and curled up as opposed to something that else that we just don't understand? Because we can understand this. It doesn't mean it's the real world. It means it's a thing we can study, find out its properties, see how it behaves, and compare it with the real world. If you just say, maybe it's something and we don't know what it is, okay, that we'll stop, we're dead. Uh, this is easy, it's straightforward, it's not enormously subtle, not, only, not these tori, these tori are pretty easy, they're not enormously subtle, they're solvable, we can work out what particle physics is like. We can work out uh, what, uh, what the world on, in such a uh, setup is like. And we can ask, how close is it? How similar is it to the real world? That's the only reason. It's a, uh, it's a setup that we know and understand. It has gravity. It has quantum mechanics. It has particles. It has bosons. It has fermions. And we can study it. It also has black holes. So we can study the black holes and find out if they do this or that. That's, that's the reason. What does it lack? It's too symmetric. It has supersymmetry and other symmetries that are just too symmetric. And we'll talk, right. Some things it lacks and some things it has too much of. So, yeah. Yeah, um, when you take the bagel and turn it into a rectangle, um, topologically they're equivalent, but if you look at the distance, a fly on the inside of it. And yeah, they don't think about the distances. Right. This is, these are when, when a mathematician speaks about a torus, or a physicist for the most part, he's talking about a topology, not talking about a geometry. Now, in fact, the torus, when it's presented as a rectangle, oh, let's, let's talk a little bit about how many, uh, how many inequivalent tori there are. Uh, what, is the, what are the parameters of a torus? All right, it's a rectangle. So first of all, it has an overall area. Okay. Or equivalently, it has a length and a height, a width and a height. Okay, so it has a width and a height, which are two parameters. One of those parameters is the size of it. You could take it to be the area. Call that a size parameter. The other is the, and that's the product of the length times the, uh, the width times the height. There's also the ratio of the width times the height. You could call it the what, aspect ratio or the shape. All right, so here is a long, thin torus. 
Here is a broad, fat torus. But these are the same. These are really the same torus. Or th th that is to say, they're geometrically identical. They're geometrically identical. Every point on here is equivalent to a point on here. This maps to this. This maps to this. We've just turned the picture on its side, and we haven't made a new kind of torus. Right. So one thing we can say is there's the ratio of the sides, but the ratio of the sides does not go from uh, 0 to infinity. It goes from 1 to infinity. Why 1 to infinity? Because when it's less than 1, the ratio, let's say, of the horizontal to the vertical. This is bigger than 1. This is less than 1. But they're the same torus. So the ratio of the sides can vary from, uh, from basically from 1 to infinity. Or well, that's just 0 to 1. Well, from 0 to 1, either way. Either way. In fact, you usually take from 0 to 1. You can go from 0 to 1. Anything else? Is there anything else that, uh, that you can do to change the torus? And the answer is yes. Here's the game that we haven't discussed. Let's go back to our piece of cylinder. We're going to identify the left edge, the left circle over here with the right circle over here. But before we do it, let's imagine a twist, a twist by an angle, so that you don't identify this point with this one up here, but you identify it with a displaced angular point. This one over here is identified with here. This one over here, identified with that. You imagine in your mind, before making the identification, making a little twist, right? and then making the identification. That's something new. And what it looks like, let's see. Let's, let's do it vertically. Let's draw it this way. Make a little twist here before we make the identification. So that slides things along the top edge. If we didn't do the twist, we would have a rectangle. If we do the twist, then we don't identify this point with this one. We identify it with that point. This point with that point. And we might as well draw it like this. We might as well draw it as, well, that doesn't look very neat. That's not quite right. Yeah. All right. Everything in the bottom gets identified with a point uh, above it. And everything on the left gets identified, but with this offset, with this angle. So to parameterize tori, there's the aspect ratio, there's the, there's the size. That can be taken to be the overall area. Then so getting rid of the area, and let's say unit things of unit area, there's the aspect ratio and there's the angle. These things are called moduli. These are the moduli of the torus. There are three of them. The three moduli of the torus are the overall size, the ratio of the height to the width, and the angle, the lean, the angle of leaning. These have technical names. The twist is called a Dane twist, D-E-H-N, after a mathematician, I suppose, named Dane. Uh, the overall volume is called a Kähler modulus, and the ratio, uh, aspect, uh, aspect ratio is called a complex structure moduli, and they have technical meanings. Uh, if you see them, you'll know roughly what they mean. Yeah. Could you flip it as well? Hmm? It seems like you flip the ring as well. Like the flip it? You mean reflect it? Yeah. Then you make a then you make a Klein bottle. It's, it's a different topology. You mean if you uh, if you take if you take this point over here, identify it with a point in the front, 
this point with that point, this point with that point, and this one with the one in the back, that's a Klein bottle. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a, um, a torus. It's not, a, it's not an orientable manifold. What about non-uniform twists? <laughs> what is that? It, it has to be a map, but it, yeah. an arbitrary continuous. Yeah, map. yeah, yeah. You can, that, uh, that's right, that's right. You can absorb that kind of thing into the metric on the torus. Uh, you're right, there are other ways of deforming the torus but those can be absorbed into the metric on the torus. Um, these tori are all flat. They have flat geometries, or they can be given flat geometries. They, since they can be drawn on the blackboard without stretching them, I don't mean the real, I don't mean the real donut. The real donut is a truly curved surface. It has curvature. On the outer boundary, it has positive curvature. On the inner near the hole here, it has negative curvature. I'm talking about this, um, this uh, mathematical structure that's been mapped onto the plane in this way. It's completely flat. Triangles on it have 180 degree uh, some of their angles, even on this one. And in particular, it's not only flat, but it's Ricci flat. It's Ricci flat and it's flat. And so string theory on these geometries is well defined. It's a good, uh, good mathematical structure for string theory to exist on. It's by far the easiest way to hide uh, other dimensions. And it's called toroidal compactification. It's not good for, it's not good for the real world. The real world is more complex than that. Um, but I thought I would show you what the simplest form of compactification is. Now I'm going to, let's see, let's take a five minute break. Somebody wanted to make an announcement, I can't remember. Yeah, you, there, there you are. Yeah, tori are all flat. Tori are all flat. Tori is the plural of torus, you realize. Tori are all flat in any number of dimensions. Uh, and therefore, they're also Ricci flat, and because they're Ricci flat, string theory, strings moving on tori are good things. They have a sensible, well-defined mathematics. There are other Ricci flat spaces uh, where you can take six dimensions that you don't like and get rid of them by compactifying them not on a torus, or so not by replacing them by a torus, but by replacing them by other Ricci flat manifolds. Um, in particular, there are a class of Ricci flat manifolds, which are known as Calabi-Yau manifolds, which have very special properties and where string theory is a good theory. These are incredibly complicated. They're far beyond uh, the, uh, the scope of this course. But they're also the kind of things that string theorists, uh, which have enough complexity and lack of symmetry that they do look more like the real world. Uh, but they don't really involve any really new concepts that we, uh, some mathematical concepts to be sure, they're very mathematically uh, difficult objects, but no really new principles uh, uh, come out of, uh, they just look more like the real world. And I'm not going to try to get into them. Uh, Taurus is good enough for us. We can see some very interesting things when we start to explore string theory on a torus. Okay, let's, uh, let's go, let's take as our model for simplicity just the infinite uh, one-dimensional world with an extra dimension that goes around in a loop. You see why I call a circle a one-dimensional torus? It's just a line element 
uh, periodically identified. All right, let's start with that. All right, we can have a particle which moves around on here, and it can have a component of motion horizontally. Nothing special about that. That's just the, uh, that's just the momentum along the direction. It would have been there even if you hadn't, compa well, even if you didn't have the extra dimension, you'd have momentum along that direction. But you also have momentum along the other direction. You can have both of them at the same time. A particle moving sort of obliquely, sort of spiraling around this thing, would have a component of momentum horizontally and a component of momentum along the circle. The components of momentum along, along the circle are quantized. Momenta, uh, momenta on periodic spaces are always quantized. The easiest way to see it is just to say, supposing, um, supposing the, the circumference of this circle, let's just call the circumference 2 pi r. That's just, a, that's just what I'm calling the circumference. If I take the momentum along the r direction, and there's a momentum along, sorry, along the circumference, let's call that p along the circumference, pc, p along the circumference, and I multiply it by r, which is the circumference divided by 2 pi, I get something which looks like an angular momentum. In fact, it is a kind of angular momentum. It's, uh, there's an angle associated with this uh, circle. It's just an angular position along here. And P times R, that's just like, it is like angular momentum, okay? That's quantized in integer multiples of Planck's constant. So the momentum along the circumference, the momentum along the circumference is quantized in units if we set Planck's constant to one, then the unit of momentum is 1 over r. Let's suppose the particle we're talking about is massless. If it happens to be a massless particle, then its momentum or the magnitude of its momentum is the same as the magnitude of its energy. Energy for a massless particle is equal to the momentum. Of course, there's a factor of the speed of light, apart from the factor of the speed of light. Energy is equal to the magnitude of the momentum. This component of the momentum can be positive or negative, and it's an integer. The implication is that, there's a, that there is a quantized amount of energy, even if the particle is not moving along the horizontal direction, if it's moving in the circular di direction, it has an energy which is n units divided by r. All right, that energy, it's from our point of view, while we don't see the circular direction, it's just a thing standing still. It's a thing standing still, but the manifestation of the fact that it's moving is that it has some energy. It has some mass, mass, mass. This is the mass now of the particle, and it comes in integer multiples of 1 over r. The smaller r is, the bigger the spacing between mass levels. Okay. The bigger the spacing between mass levels. So, by knowing the spacing, of course, we, we don't measure any of this, but uh, in principle, by measuring the spacing between the masses of these different particles, how are they different? They're different from a macroscopic, from our point of view, they look different, they have different masses. From the point of view of a small object, uh, you know, a small detector which can see inside this thing, they're just particles which have different components of momentum in this direction. Um, we, we call them different particles because they have different masses, and the spectrum of them, namely the spacing between them, tells us how big the internal space is. The bigger the internal space, the closer the levels. Let's draw a level diagram. 
energy. Energy equals zero or mass. Mass equals zero is right over here. Then we can have plus one unit of rotational momentum around here. That would give us a particle of mass one over r, and so forth. What about if n is negative? Does that mean it has negative energy? No, the, uh, the energy is the absolute value. I, I think I erased it. The energy is always positive. So there's a particle of mass 1 over r here. There's a particle of mass 1 over r here. 2 over r minus, or 2 over r. The spacing between the mass levels is a direct reflection of how big the circle is. The smaller the circle, the larger the spacing. If this circle is very, very big, then the levels are very, very close together. So if we discovered excited states of particles which were very, very, very densely spaced, we would say, ooh, it looks like there's an extra big, rather big dimension. If we find that the spacing due to this kind of motion is very, very sparse, then we say that dimension is small, right? OK. So these are the energy levels for the components of mass of a, or the mass of a particle where the particle is simply a particle moving around this direction. Now you can do something else in a compact space. You can have a different kind of particle, which from the outside, meaning from the big dimensions, just looks like a particle, but which has an entirely different structure. Oh, incidentally, if all particles are strings, if particles really are strings, then I might want to draw this as a little string over here. But just think of it as an almost tiny little particle. Let's forget the fact that it spreads out. It's a tiny particle, and it moves around. The whole center of mass of it moves around and gives it a, a series of energies in this way. But there's something else you can do. The other thing you can do with a string and a compact space like this is wind the string around like that. Here. This band around here is once wound around the cylinder of the cup. I could take a rubber band and wind it around that way. That can also move up and down the axis. It's, first of all, it's localized. It's at a definite place in the big dimensions. So it has a location from our point of view. It can move. It can move up and down. It's a particle. It's also a particle. It's a particle which is wound around the extra dimension. What is its mass? What is its mass? Its mass now is not due to its motion in this direction. It's due to the potential energy of stretching a string around that uh, distance. How much energy would you expect there to be in a string stretched around here? The answer is clearly going to be proportional to the length of the string. There's a certain tension and energy per unit length for every string. Let's set it equal to 1. We won't worry about units tonight. Tonight I'll ignore units. Set, uh, set uh, Just work in units where the string tension is 1. If a string is stretched out to a certain distance, then the mass that that string has is proportional to the length of the stretched string. How about a string which is wrapped around this direction? What would you expect its, uh, its mass to be proportional to? The circumference, r. Yeah, the radius of the circumference. So this one will have a mass equal to r, or proportional to r. But you know, you can wrap it around several times. Uh, that I can't do with the, uh, with the coffee cup, but I can draw it, I think. No, no, but I want to connect it back together again. Uh, oh, I know, I know, I got it. Yeah. Um, it, it crosses here and connects back here. Can you see it? 
If I had a rubber band, I could uh, wrap it. You, you can wrap a rubber band twice around here. Right? You take it, twist it, and put it on here. All right, how about this one? What's the, what's the mass of it? How much energy does it have? 2R. Twice as much. Twice as much stretching. So we have R. We have energy R. We have energy 2R, 3R, 4R. If the string has an orientation, in other words, if you think of the string as having a direction, then you can wrap it positively or you can wrap it negatively. Here's one wrapped positively. Here's one wrapped negatively. So this wrapping or winding number, it's called winding number. The winding number can be positive. Imagine you have a rubber band, and on the rubber band you draw little arrows to give it a sense of direction. And you're going to wrap it around your wrist. You can wrap it around your wrist so the arrows run this way or so that they run this way. So the winding number can be either positive or negative. But whatever the winding number is, the mass of that string is equal to the absolute is r times the absolute value of the winding number. OK, so there's another spectrum of particles here. And that spectrum of particles has energy levels whose distance is not proportional to 1 over r, but is proportional to r itself. Let's suppose r is very small. Let's suppose that r is very, very small. Then this spacing is large, and this spacing is very small. It takes very little energy to wrap around a small circle. Okay? But for the particles which are not wrapped, but which are or not wound around, but which are moving around, literally moving and have momentum, the spacing between levels is large if r is small. So we have these two spectra of two different kinds of particles. One is called, these, are, these ones here are called kaluza klein particles. They were, this idea has been around uh, of uh, particles having momentum in an extra compact direction that goes back to beginnings of general relativity. Uh, Kaluza first had the idea, 1917, I think, and it's grown up a great deal since then. But string theory introduced the new idea of wound particles, particles wound around. And they have very complementary kind of spectra. So if you see particles with a large spacing, you must also see particles with a small spacing. Both combinations together would tell you something about the, uh, the nature of the compact directions. But notice that there's no way to make the spacing arbitrarily large here without having very small spacing here. Small spacing, of course, means that it just takes a little bit of energy to create one of these things. On the other hand, what happens if you take R very big? Now imagine taking R very big. If you take R very big, then the spacing of these kaluza klein particles is very small. These are very close together now. R is very big. 1 over R is very small. These become very closely spaced. And what happens to these? They get very widely spaced. Why? Because it just takes a lot of energy to wrap it around a very, very big cylinder here. So you have these two complementary kinds of particles. There's almost a symmetry. There's almost a symmetry of the spectrum where you replace r by 1 over r. You replace r by 1 over r, and you replace momentum by winding number. And what happens? You just interchange these two, and the spectrum stays the same. That seems to be a symmetry of the spectrum of, of, uh, of string theory. This only applies to the extra dimensions. There's no way to wrap a string around the, x, the real x-axis. It's infinite. But as applied to the extra dimensions, there seems to be a symmetry where you replace r by 1 over r, winding by momentum around that direction, and the system comes back to itself. That no, 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 no. This is not the vertical uh, versus the horizontal. 
This is the duality between winding number and, and uh, momentum, and kaluza klein momentum. Now, from what I've told you, it's hardly clear that this is an exact um, equivalence in every possible respect. It's just an equivalence of the energy spectrum of uh, some, uh, some simple particles. In fact, it's an exact symmetry of the theory. If you take a compact direction and you start shrinking it down smaller and smaller, well, at some point, incidentally, the, uh, the spectra will be equal. There's some, some radius. There's some radius where the spacing between the kaluza klein particles and the winding particles will be the same. We could call that r equals 1 in some units. At r equals 1, the spectrum are the same. Otherwise, they cross. Um, if, you try, if you start trying to make the radius of compactification smaller and smaller, you eventually get to this point where when you cross it, you can either think of it as saying that the size is smaller than 1, or you can interchange winding and momentum and say it's bigger than 1. There's no sense, in, in a certain sense, uh, there, it's not possible to think about string theory where r is smaller than a certain size. Oh, you can think of it if you want to make it smaller than a certain size, but all that happens is it rearranges itself so that it looks like string theory on the larger space. Yeah. Uh, does R uh, less than one and R greater than one, are those different kinds of particles? Are they all fermions? Or? Oh, every, uh, fermions, bosons, uh, they, all, uh, they all do the same thing. Oh, so there's 10 or 26 dimensions. It's, uh, it applies to both. Yeah, yeah, it applies to every compact direction here I've only indicated one compact direction circle. We can apply it to problems with several compact directions. But this is a kind of freakish, surprising result that's characteristic really of string theory. It is not characteristic of uh, point particles moving in uh, on closed spaces like this. It's the interchange of winding with momentum. That hardly seems an obvious thing to do. Remarkably, the entire theory, the scattering amplitudes, the spectrum of particles, the whole works uh, is symmetric under this interchange. So it's one open strings and the other closed strings? No, 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 no. They're both closed strings. Closed strings. Closed strings. Open strings, it doesn't make any sense to wind around. They just unwind so themselves. Right, no. The no, they're clo both closed strings. In a theory, I, I should have said that. In a theory of closed strings, there's this interchange symmetry. Open strings are a little more uh, complicated. Yeah, and we'll talk about them. Would that be similar to the, the black hole analogy where dimensions become time-like and time becomes dimension-like? Nope. 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 What it is is it's saying that there's a certain distance where when you try to think of string theory on a space smaller than that, it's equivalent to string theory on a space bigger than that. Trying to shrink the diameter of a compactification to arbitrarily small distances, you get frustrated. It just rearranges itself so that it looks like the theory on a bigger space. <coughs> does, does that help get rid of self-energies? Well, it does say in some sense there's a smaller, uh, a smaller size scale in string theory, but uh, uh, it keeps things from being infinite, yes. Um, yeah. well, that's true if you have a winding number, right? I mean, what's, what's to say that there is a winding number? Is that just a theoretical model, or is there an analogy to physical space? Um, so in the absence of a winding number, right? And you have just if you have a compact dimension, then it's possible to think of strings which are wound. Are you asking? Maybe you're asking how you make them if you don't have them to begin with. Yeah, well, I'm asking if, if there is no existence of a winding number. A winding number or a particle with a winding number? A particle with a winding number. You can make them. I'll show you how to make them. <laughs>
we do have to start with something. So we start with a particle which has no winding number. That's a little string that looks like that. Okay. Now we take this and we pull it around. We stretch it out. It's still got no winding number. It's not wound around the thing. And now we stretch it all the ways around here so that it comes back the back side and comes up over here. Can you see what I've done? It still has no winding number. The winding number of this piece is canceled out by the winding number of that piece. So you take your arm, you take the rubber band, and you pull it around and then take, uh, you know, and then take uh, the two pieces here. And that's what you're left with. That still has no winding number. But remember now that in string theory, the basic process of interaction is for things like this to become things like this, rearrangement. So if you sit there for a while, this string will rearrange and form that. Now what does this have? It has two particles with opposite winding number. Okay? We still have a net zero winding number. One is wound one way, one is wound the other way, but now they're disconnected and they're free to separate. Throw that one away, just eject it out of the system, give it some uh, velocity, and when it gets off to Alpha Centauri, forget about it, and you're left with a, with a particle with winding number. Uh, so whether, whether you like them or not, you can't forbid them. Some things you can try to forbid. You can say if they're not there to begin with, they'll never be there, uh, possibly. Some things you can't forbid because you can imagine that the processes of the theory itself, the important processes in the theory, can force them on you, and these get forced on you. Of course, they always get forced in pairs, but you can... That's, that's uh, you, you throw away half of them and just uh, do some experiments with the re remaining ones. And this is with increasing energy, I guess, then? The, uh, the Kaluza Klein closed string gets larger, so that would be more energy? Yeah, it does. It gets some energy from not only from momentum, but from being stretched. Yeah, it takes energy to do it. Uh, but, you know, this is the sort of thing which would happen if you collided two particles with no winding number, just two Kaluza Klein particles, you collide them hard, every possible combination of stuff happens, and among the things which would happen is these winding and anti-winding things would go flying off. Uh, it's, and the logic is the same as the logic of electric charge. Supposing the world started with no electric charge, does that mean there would be no electrons? No, any kind of collision that would take place uh, would create electrons and positrons, and then the positrons could go flying off to some other place, and you'd be left with electrons. So the logic is really no different than electric charge. You can't not have electric charge because you can always make it in pairs. Uh, the net charge in the world might be zero for all we know. Um, the net winding number might be zero, but who cares? We can do experiments on, uh, on you know, on a region which contains a, uh, a winding number. So, yeah, so this has a name, incidentally. The equivalence between theories which look different, usually called a duality. This is called T-duality capital T duality, and the T in this case stands for torus. The T stands for torus, this is torus duality, or T duality. And as I say, it's a duality which relates compactifications on very small geometries to compactifications on big geometries. And it's a rather startling thing. I mean, it, uh, when it was first discovered, it surprised everybody. It, what it means is that geometry defined in terms of how strings... The, geometry can also often be recovered or partly recovered from the spectrum of modes uh, on a uh, 
the geometry of a drum head, the shape of a drum head. This is a famous mathematical question. Can the shape of a drum head be predicted from the sound that it makes, from the, uh, from the spectrum of vibrations? The answer is not quite, but you can predict a lot of the shape of the drum head. The same question applies to these compactifications. From the spectrum of particles, the spectrum of vibrational energies, vibrational and other kinds of energies, can you predict the shape and, uh, or the size of the compact directions? And the answer is yes to a large extent. Um, but there are some ambiguities and some dualities that you can't tell if it's a tiny geometry or if it's a big geometry because these two go into each other. That would not be the case with a drum, I assure you. Uh, you would not mistake a small drum for a big drum. No. Okay, good. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.